Um, next up for science and community, we have Dr. Heather Price. So Dr. Heather Price is a climate scientist, climate justice activist, chemistry professor, and researcher. She earned her PhD in chemistry and conducted her postdoctoral research with the University of Washington Program on Climate Change. Her current National Science Foundation research project focuses on improving undergraduate STEM education through the integration of climate justice, equity, and civic engagement across the college curriculum. Dr. Heather is co-founder of talkclimate.org and on the strike team of Seattle 500 Women Scientists. She anchors the topics of this conference in the evidence and gives us memorable examples and metaphors to share with others. Welcome Dr. Heather Price. Oh, uh, thank you so much. Hopefully you can see me now. <laughs> uh, and thank you, Jacqueline, and to the uh, organizers for this conference. This is fantastic. I'm going to share, uh, as Jacqueline said, uh, some of the climate science and how the science connects to our communities. So my address here is global temperature data. And let me go back. The, uh, red, the blue stripes at my shoulder are cold years, red or hot, from 1850 to 2018 at my knee. And the lives of young people, that's the red part of my dress. And my Twitter post, uh, that shows the drastic rise in CO2 during my life from 326 parts per million when I was born to, seven, uh, to 415 when I posted this in 2019. Now parts per million, PPM, if, uh, if you, that means that if you have a balloon with a million particles of air, when I was born, 326 of those particles in that balloon would have been CO2. Well, this past week, we've reached 420 parts per million for CO2 in the air. And during this, uh, this same time, so this is um, the same uh, data as my dress. So if, if you are younger than 45, you've never lived on earth during a colder than average year. And in fact, every year of my life, except for the one here circled in blue, has been hotter than the 20th century average. 19 of the 20 hottest years on record have occurred since 2000. And when we look at the impact on our community in Seattle, we can see the inequities of these heat waves. In Seattle, already the number of days over 90 degrees Fahrenheit each year has more than doubled from three days historically to the last decade being six days per year. Um, and that's since the records began, uh, it's getting hot. And this heat exposure depends a lot on where you live in the city. Studies show that low income and historically redlined areas where black, indigenous, and other historically marginalized communities live are correlated with larger urban heat island effects. And you can see this in our own map um, with South Seattle. And all of this heating, it's coming from carbon that is emitted from burning coal, oil, methane, so-called natural gas, but also from animal agriculture, especially beef and deforestation. Over 85% of the carbon emissions here in Washington are from burning and extracting fossil fuels in our transportation buildings and fossil fuel electricity. And the world, even with COVID, we've reached a new peak of 420 parts per million. That means that even with the lockdowns, carbon dioxide concentrations in the atmosphere still went up. We did see a slight drop, 6%, in emissions of carbon dioxide during 2020. Right here, you can see it. But that's like a smoker who's smoking almost an entire pack of cigarettes, but leaves one behind unsmoked. They're still smoking a lot. And just like the smoker, polluters need to not just reduce emissions, they need to quit. This graph here shows almost a million years of carbon dioxide measured from ice cores. CO2 never went above about 300 parts per million through all of the past ice ages and warm periods. And look at where we are today. There's that 420. For more uh, and more than an ice age change, right? You can see here's an ice age change. And then here we've got done more than that just within the past couple of hundred years. And by the way, the safe level for CO2 is 350. We passed that back when I was in high school. So let's put this huge rise in CO2 into perspective with something that we Washingtonians all know, volcanoes. 
So I remember watching Mount St. Helens erupt from my front porch. I grew up uh, in North Tacoma and all of the carbon emissions from burning coal, oil, methane, gas in our homes, our buildings, factories, cars, ships, airplanes, deforestation, all of those emissions are equivalent to over 4,000 Mount St. Helens eruptions going off every year. That's over 10 eruptions of worth of carbon dioxide and greenhouse gases every day, all year long. And if you're over, or if you are 30 years old, um, or if you're old enough to remember uh, when Nirvana's song Smells Like Teen Spirit came out in 1990, consider this, more than half of all fossil fuel emissions of carbon have been pumped into the atmosphere since you were born. The other half of those fossil fuel emissions um, were emitted from the dawn of industrialization back in the 1700s until 1990. So we've been accelerating. 30% of the emissions have gone into the air since my teenager was born. And about a quarter of this fossil carbon dioxide has gone into the oceans and is causing ocean acidification, which harms shellfish and the people who depend on them for food and livelihood. Oyster farmers right here in our Salish Sea can no longer grow economically viable oysters naturally in Hood Canal. For more than 10 years now, they've had to grow the baby oysters in a building in Hawaii and then transport and plant them in the Salish Sea once their shells are thick enough to survive in the now corrosive waters. And fossil fuel climate change also harms people's health. A new study from Harvard shows that particulate matter air pollution called PM2.5 specifically from burning fossil fuels is responsible for one in five deaths worldwide and over 950 deaths every day in the United States. So PM2.5, these particles are so tiny, 3% of the width of a human hair and can travel deep into the alveoli of our lungs and pass into our bloodstream, affecting lung and heart health. And communities of color are especially impacted because of historic sacrifice zones where freeways and industry are built nearby. I still recall doing air quality studies near Houston and how the petroleum and chemical factories that were the source of the toxic pollution I was measuring were next to an elementary school in a predominantly Mexican American community. This is an example of environmental racism where polluting industries are built in communities with few resources to push back. And this PM 2.5 it's also one of the many air pollutants formed when gas is burned in our homes and our buildings. Children who live in homes with gas stoves have a 42% higher risk of asthma. And often methane plants and pipelines are forced through neighborhoods and indigenous lands without permission. We're seeing this with the recent expansion of methane gas pipelines right here in our state in Snohomish with the and also with um, a fracked gas methane plant. Uh, in Tacoma. And a lot of scientists, myself included, used to think that methane was cleaner for climate. We now know, thanks to recent research, that methane, natural gas, is currently worse for climate than coal or oil. And here's why. So-called methane or natural gas is mostly methane. Looks like this as a molecule and is a super strong greenhouse gas. It's 86 times more potent than carbon dioxide. Here's carbon dioxide for the first 20 years. And then it's oxidized to CO2, which persists for centuries to thousands of years, continuing to heat our planet and acidify our oceans. And just like all gases, methane leaks. And any leak over about 3% means that methane gas is worse for climate than burning coal. And the latest research shows that leak rate is well over that 3% threshold. And don't be fooled by the latest push for us to use biogas or renewable natural gas RNG. Methane is methane, no matter its source. And when methane is burned in our homes, it creates indoor air pollution similar to living with a smoker. Now, this first column here represents the known reserves of gas, methane gas, coal and oil. And this doesn't even count what the fossil fuel industry is still searching for. The orange column heights here and here represent the carbon budget left for reaching 1.5 or two degrees Celsius according to the science of the IPCC, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change reports. 
And we're already over one degree Celsius. You saw that in my dress and people are already suffering. Every fraction of a degree rise makes a difference in terms of human suffering from death and fires, heat waves, hurricanes, flooding, insect-borne disease, refugees escaping drought and sea level rise. The science is clear. To minimize suffering, the world must stop looking for new fossil fuels. The industries need to leave half of the known reserves of methane gas, oil, and coal in the ground and make this transition to a decarbonized world with climate justice and equity. Now, there's many definitions of climate justice. I'm going to share just two, inter versus intra-generational climate justice. So inter-generational climate justice is illustrated by this photo of my children and their cousins with their great grandma and refers to the climate impacts of one generation's resource use on future generations who are not yet here um, and do not yet have a voice. Whereas intra-generational climate justice refers to the disproportionate impacts on people today already experiencing climate change. And this boulder here represents the climate impacts the person or a community is dealing with. And then those wedges, those are the various factors that affect a person or a community's ability to contend with or to adapt or mitigate um, the climate impacts. So the bigger those wedges, the harder it's gonna to be to deal with the climate impact. And because of historical oppression and colonization from rich countries and peoples, uh, those most affected by intra-generational climate justice or injustice are people in the global South, communities of color, particularly indigenous black Latinx living in rich countries. And those impacted by climate change are also the least responsible for causing it. The richest 0.54%, according to a Nature article, that's 42 million people, their lifestyle emissions from flying, driving, big homes, consumption are greater than the poorest half of the global population, which is 3.6 billion people. And a local example of intra-generational climate justice is smoke from climate exacerbated West Coast fires. The boulder in this case represents PM 2.5 air pollution, and a person or a community's ability to contend with it depends a lot on the many factors illustrated in the wedges. Too many of our neighbors and my students are dealing with very wide wedges of housing insecurity, unemployment. They may have health care, but maybe not the funds to afford asthma medications. For instance, I have a child whose flow vent inhaler cost us $250 last year. And there's many ways to shrink these wedges, such as from housing, jobs, affordable health care, mutual aid. In Seattle, a BIPOC-led community organization, Got Green, set up a trading space for air filters and box fans last year at the station coffee shop and advertised it on Instagram. This mutual aid helps individual communities shrink some of their wedges and helps to adapt to climate impacts that are already here. Now, we need both individual and collective actions. For those who can afford to make the individual changes like installing solar panels, getting an electric stove instead of gas, a heat pump instead of a gas range or a gas furnace, um, these will help ripple out and spur the change that's really needed. What's really needed is system change that benefits everyone. And everyone has a voice that can take civic action like Mona was talking about, to push for system change, push for policies that um, uh, amplify the voice of those who are on the front lines and end our reliance on fossil fuels. And I like to think about the cleaner, healthier, and more peaceful world as we electrify everything and fuel everything with zero carbon wind and solar. No one gets cancer from wind power. No one gets asthma from solar, and it's hard to imagine uh, war fought over who controls the wind and the sun. So today, more than half of Americans are concerned or alarmed about global warming, but what's missing is that few people are talking about it. From today's talks uh, and tomorrow, you're gonna learn so much about climate and its impacts and how to address it, probably more than most people you know share what you know. Just like you don't need to be a doctor to tell someone to stop smoking around a baby, everyone can talk about climate. And the key is to connect over issues related to climate that you both care about. And for the young people out there, talk with your parents. Your parents really do care what you think. And research shows that children have a significant impact on their parents' views on climate change. And the most pronounced impact is on the views of conservative parents and the influence of daughters on their fathers. 
Now, climate touches everything. So it's easier than you think, uh, than you might think to strike up a climate conversation. For some ideas, please check out talkclimate.org. It's a community hub organized by climate scientists, mental and mental health, uh, mental and medical health professionals, artists, musicians, and activists. Uh, and we've put together information and tips on how to have productive, courageous, and empowering conversations about climate change. And it also includes recommendations for climate justice organizations like 350.org that's helping to um, put this uh, talk, uh, this uh, conference on, where you can take action for climate justice in your community. Uh, and I'll, there's my email address. I teach at North Seattle College, so you're welcome to reach out if you have any other questions. And I'll also uh, make my uh, transcript available if people want to get more details about what I just talked about. Thanks. Dr. Price, thank you so much for teaching us the unfortunate facts that we all really need to hear. And uh, particularly, I was, uh, my mind was blown about the link between asthma and gas stoves and children. Um, I'm definitely going to keep that clinical pearl uh, moving forward as a clinician. And uh, your passion for climate science is contagious, and I hope we all catch the passion to do something about this. So thank you for educating us on the impact and how this is affecting disproportionately on communities of color.